All right, let me go ahead and pray. Lord, just uh, thank you for the gift. The gift of this evening, God, that you've given to us. Lord, that, that, that every person in this room, Lord, is of their own will made a choice in their heart to be in fellowship, to be in the word, and Lord, to, to, to seek you to some degree or another. Maybe it's part of us <laughs> fights to get here and then we end up making it. And Lord, we just ask that your spirit, Lord, would just, just, just fall down on uh, this time of fellowship with one another, uh, Lord, together in the word. And Lord, that your spirit would rightly divide your word, Lord. I know as I read, I'm, I'm thinking about something from how the spirit's applying this in me and yet another brother, it's, it's applying uh, the same truth, maybe in a different facet or a different way. I just ask that you make us all open to what your uh, spirit uh, speaks to us as we open your word together. And Lord, that you would rightly divide that word, that we would heed it, that we would receive it, that we would build our life upon that word that's from you, God, because when we do that, we're building our life on the rock, Lord. And, and we know when we do that, we won't be shaken, God, when the storms come. Because you're with us. You're our foundation. That's you and your word, God. And we just ask you to open our hearts to it right now. In Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. Amen. All right. So we're going to be in Acts 15, gentlemen, today. And uh, I might play around with this thing. I don't know. If it was wireless. <laughs> Walk around. Uh, so last week I covered Acts 15. Uh, verses 1 down through uh, 22, and I think it's uploaded on YouTube, but for the sake of context, and I know a few of you weren't here last week, I'm just going to read through the entire chapter so we can all listen to it together and have about seven or so different things that I wrote down as uh, I was looking at it, the Word, and it corresponds with other parts of the Word that I thought might be helpful uh, and basically the message for tonight is how God gives to direction to his people. We'll pick up in Acts 15 verse 1 and, and read through. It says, And certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren, Unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Therefore, when Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and dispute with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders about this question. This wasn't no small trip, by the way. <laughs> you can look at it geographically, it was a few hundred miles. But verse 3, it says, So being on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenicia and Samaria, describing the conversion of the Gentiles, and they caused great joy to all the brethren. Verse 4, and then they... When they had come to Jerusalem, they finally showed up. They were received by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they reported all things that God had done with them. But some of the sect of the Pharisees who believed rose up. And this is, um, we ported, pointed out some of these things last week. So this is probably the group of people that uh, potentially opposed Jesus that came to believe in Jesus that were Pharise among the, that sect of the Pharisees. But they were saying here, it is necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. In verse 6, now the apostles and elders came together to consider this matter. And when they were there, they had much dispute. So this was a lot of contention, a little bit going on in this meeting. Peter rose up in the midst of this and said to them, Men and brethren, you know that a good while ago, God chose among us that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. Verse 8, so God, who knows the heart, acknowledged them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. And made no distinction between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why do you test God by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? And this is kind of like last week's message. Again, you can maybe be able to go on YouTube and look at it. I'm not sure if it's up or not. But I talked about a few different ways that sometimes we struggle with or we fight with legalism. And, but it's kind of pivied off of that verse. But verse 11, 
But we believe that through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved in the same manner as they. Then all the multitude kept silent and listened to Barnabas and Paul declaring how many miracles and wonders God had worked them through and among the Gentiles. And after they had become silent, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, listen to me. Simon has declared how God at first visited the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And with this, the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written. After this, I will return and will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. And I will rebuild its ruins, and I will set it up. And so the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles who are called by my name says the Lord, who does all these things. Now known to God from all eternity are his works. Therefore, I judge that we should not trouble those from among the Gentiles who are turning to God. But as we write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, and things strangled, and from blood. For Moses has had throughout many generations those who preach him in every city being read in the synagogues every Sabbath. Verse 22, then it pleased the apostles and the elders and with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company there in Jerusalem to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, who was also named Barsabbas, which is kind of interesting, son of the Sabbath. We talked about some of that last week, but they're sending him up to uh, the Gentiles. And Silas, leading men among the brethren. Verse 23, they also wrote this letter by them. The apostles, the elders, and the brethren, to the brethren who are in the Gentile, who are of the Gentiles in Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia, greetings, since we have heard that some of who went out from us have troubled you with words, unsettling your souls, saying you must be circumcised and keep the law to whom we gave no such commandment. <laughs> it's a little more unsettling than just to the soul, but you know. <laughs> but verse 25 it seemed good to us, being assembled with one accord, to send chosen men to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men who've risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Man, that's good company to be among. Verse 27, we have therefore sent Judas and Silas, who will also report the same things by word of mouth. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things, that you abstain from things offered to idols, from blood, from things strangled, and from sexual immorality. If you keep yourselves from these, you will do well. Farewell. Verse 30, and it says, So when they were sent off, they came to Antioch, and when they had gathered the multitude together, they delivered the letter. And when they had read it, they rejoiced over its encouragement. <laughs> pretty, pretty excited to know you're not going to be circumcised today. To stay saved. <laughs> Verse 32, And now when Judas and Silas themselves, being prophets also, exhorted and strengthen the brethren with many words. And after they had stayed there for a time, they were sent back with greetings from the brethren to the apostles. However, it seemed good to Silas to remain there. Paul and Barnabas also remained in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. And then after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, Let us go back now and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they're doing. Now Barnabas was determined, Barnabas was determined to take with them John called Mark. But Paul insisted that they should not take him with them, the one who had departed from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. Then the contention became so sharp that they parted from one another. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas and departed, being commended by the brethren to the grace of God. And last verse, and he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. There's a, there's a, there's a lot going on here. Like, <laughs> the implications of this chapter is the reason we're even sitting here, to be honest with you. We wouldn't be sitting here if this meeting may not have happened, potentially. Obviously, God's good, and he allowed it to happen. So, uh, again, last week we covered the first 22 verses of the chapter. Um, and we're starting tonight probably from around verse uh, 21. I'll probably start back at verse 21 to 22. Read down a couple little bit and we'll pick some of this apart. But a few, a few things. I wrote down seven things. So if you got something to write with, you may want to 
jot these down and think them through a little bit deeper on your own if you want to broaden this application out for yourself. But I wrote down seven different things that I extracting from this chapter, basically on how God gives direction to his people. And that's what a lot of us are seeking after, you know, when people come to church in a lot of situations and cases. Maybe it's through a struggle or an issue. Or just as a believer, we're seeking the Lord and we need direction on issues and things. And hopefully these things will give you some, some biblical uh, um, reference that you can point to. And you can see maybe it's a decision that's coming up in your life that you need to apply these things for and toward. But we see them, I think, listed in here or littered in here these things. One of the first things, and I often refer to this in my own walk with the Lord, I've seen it in the Gospels, I've seen it in the letters, I see it in the Hebrew Scriptures uh, mention, and it's the testimony of two or three witnesses that God gives often to establish His Word. Jesus talks about it, you can read in Matthew 18, Paul talks about it in a church discipline situation, uh, 1 Corinthians 5, you see back in 2 Corinthians, restoring somebody, there's, there's, there's issues where he's talking about letting the word be established by two or three witnesses. We see it in the meeting in the first 22 verses. I'm not trying to go back to that, but we see it happen in this meeting. We saw Peter stand up and give a testimony in the middle of a group of leaders, right? Referring to Acts 10, we talked about that before. We see James step up, and he pulls out the word, right? He quotes Amos chapter 9. He said, hey, guys, got a word from the Lord right here, man. And it was, it was a word of wisdom. It was one, wasn't just some off-the-cuff thing that he had planned, perhaps, per se. But it was in the midst of that. It was a spiritual word of wisdom that melted down the contention and the difficulty of the situation. And it brought unity in the midst. So it was a word of wisdom. It talked about in James, his own book, right? <laughs> he writes about it later in James chapter 3. The wisdom from above is pure, peaceable, full of good fruit. So we got those confirmation words and also... We talked about last week, too, a little bit, the uh, testimony of God from Paul and Barnabas. They were out there. They're, this is like just coming back from the church's first, quote, unquote, missionary trip. And they were just, like, overjoyed by seeing God doing unbelievable and amazing things. You know, you can read back chapter 13, 14. And when you look at some of those amazing things, and we talked about this last time, some of those amazing things... I don't know if Paul brought him up in, this, in, the, in these meetings, but he, he went through some tough stuff, man. I mean, he got rocked, literally, with stones. Like, got beat down with rocks and drug out of a city. And, um, and yet he is full of, God, of joy because he is seeing God supernaturally confirm the ministry in a powerful way. So those, all those were like big testimonies and hearing an answer from the Lord. And a, a couple of quick things before we get into verse 22, I wrote down, taken from this, you know, part of how we get direction from the Lord is being among God's people. That's, that's one of the things, meeting in the house of the Lord. You know, uh, David wrote in Psalm 73, verse 16 and 17, when it was, he was weary when he looked at the world around him and the people succeeding around him. He was just like, it just, it just got to his heart. And, and it said it was too painful for me there in verse 16 of Psalm 73. It says, until I went into the sanctuary of God. And it's when he came into that fellowship, it was a pivot point for his heart. You're talking about a man that was after God's own heart who wrote, like, God knows a, a ton of the book, probably, you know, comparably to Paul, a pretty big chunk of scriptures dedicated to the guy, right? So the, all the 66 chapters that David wrote. But, um, or on the life of David, I should say. And then the Psalms, and then also influencing, I think, the Proverbs when you read those. But he's saying this about himself. He, he struggled with seeing the success, the prosperity of the world around him. But then he came in the house of God, and he was refreshed, encouraged in that place of worship. The other thing I brought down is number two. And I'll read a couple cross-references here on this one. This is an important one. Paul, we saw at the beginning of this chapter, made an appeal to the authority. Of leadership. Paul could have looked at his ministry, right, really easy, and just saw all the miracles that, Paul, that God had wrought through him, and he could have took it upon himself. He's like, man, them guys in Jerusalem, forget those jokers, man, they don't know what they're talking about. I got my own ministry, you know. He could have just went with it, right, but he didn't. There was a humility, a respect. He said, you know, he even says when you read 
uh, in Galatians chapter 2, which is another reference um, to uh, the chapter that we're in that Paul expounds a little bit more on this meeting that they had. So if you want to read that uh, to get more out of it. He, see, he said there was just a sense in his heart, a sensitivity to the spirit that I had to, had to get confirmation, had to get a clear word. I didn't want to run my race in vain, you know. There was a respect there. There was a respect there that God had given him. In Romans uh, 13, you may want to jot these down if you want to look at them later. And this is a tough one. I'll be honest, man. I've been um, getting prepared. I don't know if y'all been here at all for Thursday. Started a little bit in the book of Daniel at least when I'm up to the plate, <laughs> my, my round of uh, teaching. But, you know, I see Daniel and his respect for the authority that was over him. It's, I'm blown away. I don't think I could do what Daniel did in a lot of ways, especially, I guess, just being raised in the South, right? <laughs> Talk to these guns and stuff. Be like, Nebuchadnezzar, you're going down, man. I'm trying to submit to you. <laughs> but, no, we see this in Romans 13 about this the authority. It says, let every soul... Be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority, zero authority, except from God. And the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority, authority resist the ordinance of God. And those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. And, and, and you can read the rest of the chapter, talks about taxes and all that fun stuff that we love doing, right? But, <laughs> but it's, 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 there's, a, there's, a, there's a reverence in Paul in his appeal to the leadership. Obviously, he had God's authority. No, no question about that, right? God's working in your life, Paul, no question about that. But there was still a sensitivity there. And then uh, I encourage you, um, I don't know how far along this is. You can read Hebrews 13, 7, and 17, some of the pastoral letters, 1 Timothy, uh, 2 Timothy, Titus. I mean, we've got whole chunks of Scripture that talk about spiritual authority as well. So these, these are authorities that God puts in our lives. But if you're wanting to hear from the Lord yourself, get direction from the Lord yourself, be open, have an appeal toward the authority that God has in your life. Maybe even ask your mom or your dad if they're still around, you know. Uh, I mean, you got enough discernment to know, man, if it's not from the word, and maybe your parents aren't saved or whatever, then you, know, you can disregard that, you know, not to obey it or follow it. But, you know, God puts that authority in your life for a reason. You know, I'm teaching, having to teach this hard lesson to my own son, who I know his mother is not, I mean, I'm not talking about my current wife, so just FYI, but <laughs> from my former wife, is not really following, it's just not, you know, following the Lord. But I'm teaching, man, respect respect man God's put her in your life for a reason you know if she tells you to disobey Jesus we can talk but you know right now you know we, 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 we're, we're on we're, we're just trying to get you respect authority period but um that's an appeal get direction in your life uh number three verse 22 it says then it pleased the apostles and elders with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul Barnabas namely Judas who was also named Barabbas and Silas, leading men among the brethren. So we see that this is another appeal, and it kind of relates to the first or the second one there. So we talked about testimony, two, three witnesses, appeal to authority. The church's stance based on God's word is good for your, is, is a good direction, directional point. We see that here in verse 22. It pleased the apostles, utters the whole church. And, it's, and this was a, di a directive that they, they had received uh, from the church. And this was going to be a landmark case in point, us being here together, right? <laughs> the Gentiles being accepted into the kingdom from what we get from this. And uh, Proverbs 22, verse 28, it says, Do not remove the ancient landmark which your fathers have set. These are the church fathers, if you will, establishing a word from God for the believers, and this is going to be sent out because the pretext of this, verse 21, is, you know, James is still talking from the meeting. He says, For Moses had throughout many generations, has had throughout many generations those who preach him, Moses, in every city, being read in all the synagogues and every Sabbath. So, what's the response? They're getting this letter together, and they're getting the letter out through Paul, through some of these chosen men that we're looking at here, to the rest of these areas where what? Moses has been taught, right? want to get the word out, this distinction. 
that God's making now. It's not Jews over here and this new sect of Judaism, which was kind of what was coming up a little bit when you follow this closely. The Jews were kind of looked in this as a different sect of Judaism. But it was no, that God was birthing a new people. The Gentiles, the Jews, part of the same family of God, right? Through the blood of Jesus. So let's get, all right. So that's another point. Uh, God's, the church's stance based on the word of God is, is one of the ancient landmarks. One of the things that, what has the church said throughout history and time that has taught us from the word that is true? And it's interesting today how, uh, and, and they still exist. We, we appeal to these people in the church belt, our church type of church does. But it's interesting, there's still these little segmented groups that just, they, they, they just believe within themselves and their little sphere of influence within Christianity, right? That their little way is absolutely right and more superior than what the majority of other Christians believe or what the Bible has taught throughout history from believers around the world, biblically, that follow the Bible and follow Jesus. They have a little subset, right? There's, there's, there's little groups that exist out there. I mean, there's groups that talk about baptizing in the Jesus name only, that exist. It's a, it was part of the Pentecostal movement where they basically say if you baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, your baptism doesn't count. <laughs> I mean, you got little subsets of groups that exist in Christendom, and it's and it's strange that because they don't they remove the ancient landmark, so to speak, and and they and they establish their own little way, and they look at all the other 99 percent of Christians that exist, right? And they say, well, the 99% of all Christians, we're part of the point zero 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 one percent of Christians that exist that believe the word and have found this new discovery and we're correct and the rest of everybody else is going to hell. <laughs> I mean, it's like, what? you just throwing out all church history, all the Bible, just whoosh, out the window just, just to, because you're one little thing, you believe that's right. And it's, and it's an interesting thing. But um, and you, and we see that the, 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 it's an important pivot point that the majority of Christians, like, we've done crusades, we've interacted with ministries throughout the course of time here. I remember when we did Miami, we had 51 different churches involved, you know, from our church. Some of them, you know, didn't believe exactly this and this about every little issue, but we believe the basics, the main things concerning Jesus Christ. And that's the important thing, that we don't throw out the, the, the ancient landmark, the word that God has given to us as believers. So uh, back to verse 22, we see in this company the people that God uses to give us direction. He uses gifted men in the body of Christ. I wrote that down. We see a list of them that, that, that were chosen, that the church leaders felt were gifted to bring back this message to Antioch 300 miles up. Where these Gentiles, it's kind of like uh, we mentioned it last week, sort of the uh, central city, if you will, where... Um, for the Gentiles, the church that were Gentiles, that part of the church. So there's gifted men in the body of Christ. God uses for you and he uses for me gifted people in the body of Christ. You know, we're, we're uniquely in Ephesians chapter 4 with uh, Pastor David on Sundays. And he goes through lists of gifts and different things. Paul mentions in 1 Corinthians 12, Romans 12, other lists. But it talks about how each part of the body of Christ has a functional point and a purpose and it even talks about those people in the body of Christ that don't seem as maybe important but how they're the most what necessary you know how they how, how maybe they don't seem maybe this person this part of the body don't seem as I don't know you want to kind of hide that part of the body you know put some clothes <laughs> over it or something but it's 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 vital you have to have it right you have to have it. I mentioned uh, a while back of oh, somebody in our, our ministry was really important. And I was saying, it's like, you know, you don't see him up front talking all the time. But I said, it's kind of like the heart. I mean, if, you, if I sat up here and I had like this window, you know, like a real visual window that you could see all of what was going on in my heart, you know, and I could see it every time I looked in the mirror, it probably freaked me out. But if you saw it, You'd be like, man, I hope that thing keeps pumping. You know, you'd see it. Do, 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 do. You know, it's a vital part of who, who I am, you know, you know who I, of who, who, how I exist. And so it is with the body of Christ. And there's gifted people in the body that God uses 
to speak to you, to speak to me. If we notice it, we acknowledge it, we pay attention to it, we appreciate it, all the people that God brings and the different gifts and the different facets of who they are, the more we appreciate it, you know, I often, like I said, that example with my own heart, I'm more thankful the more I think like that. You know, about my own body's like, God, thank you, this thing's still kicking, man, 37 years old, it's still working, thank you, Lord. You know, that blows the lungs, they're still involuntarily breathing, thank you, God, thank you, God. You know, you look at that person that's maybe behind the desk, you know, in the church office, setting up stuff for an event where somebody's going to come and be encouraged and be blessed. Maybe their lives change in a big way. They're a vital part of the body of Christ. So gifted people speak to us through the body. The fifth thing, that's the fourth thing. The fifth thing is that uh, we get gifts of prophecy, discernment, words of wisdom, and words of knowledge. Uh, we'll read through this letter real quickly again. It says, Then they wrote the letter by them, the apostles, the elders, and the brethren, to the brethren, the brothers that are in the Gentiles in Antioch, Syria, and Sicilia, Greetings, since we have heard that some who went out from us have troubled you with words, unsettling your souls, saying that you must be circumcised and, and keep the law, to whom we gave no such commandment. And this is an important thing. They're being very upfront. The, there was a little subgroup, if you remember back earlier in the chapter, if you caught that verse, of people that were secret brethren that came up that were stirring up the believers in Antioch, saying, hey, you guys, you're not really saved unless you're circumcised, man. You know, which didn't fly over with Paul and Barnabas very well. That's why they had this meeting. But the people in Jerusalem are saying, guys, listen, we didn't send those people. That, that ain't us. That's not from the authority that God's established here. So you can see how even the enemy gets into little situations. Like there's probably an appearance from the Gentiles' perspective and up in Antioch. There, there may be this thought that exists that, man, those, those guys in Jerusalem, they don't like us, Peter and uh, James, man, they, they maybe, I don't know, they're, they're saying we got to get circumcised to be saved. A false message. And they're clarifying here with this letter. You know, this, isn't, this ain't, we can give you all a commandment for that. Verse 25, it seemed good to us being assembled one accord to send chosen men to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul. Men who've risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Man, those are the kind of people I want to hang out with. I said it a few weeks back, but I'm trying to reach up. When you're in your walk with the Lord and you're going through issues and situations of your life and struggles and all those things, reach up to people who are doing what? I would say risking their life for the Lord. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's the person of integrity, I would think. I mean, what if, <laughs> they're, they're laying their life down for this. They're, they're all in. But it's, it's, a, it's a way to, to get more out of your relationship with Jesus. Is you, even if the person, maybe they're not in reality, but at least in your perception, they are following the Lord maybe more closely than you are. You can get counsel from those people. Um, moving on, verse 27 says, We have therefore sent Judas and Silas, who also report the same things by the word of mouth. For it seemed good to us, and good, or for it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us, to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things, that you abstain from the things offered to idols, blood, things strangled, sexual immorality, keep yourselves from these things, you will do well. And so we see this, this, this word of wisdom is not just something that they concocted in their noggins, right? It's, it's, it's a word of wisdom, a, word, a gift of prophecy, of discernment, and of wisdom. You read 1 Corinthians uh, 12, talks about these gifts that come from the Holy Spirit. And these things often occur in, uh, in these settings of, of waiting on the Lord. Uh, in, a, in a teaching setting like this, maybe the Spirit's just bloop, boom, dropping something in on you from out of nowhere, even unrelated to this, I don't know. But it's just a word of wisdom for your life or a word of knowledge that's from the Lord. Or maybe you speak to a brother or pray with one afterward and get a word of wisdom, a word of knowledge. But put yourself in situations where this is occurring. Put yourself in places where the gifts of prophecy, discernment, wisdom are coming out. Be in a small life group or something where you're waiting on the Lord, you're hearing from the Lord. Because it, it's in those places that God gives you that direction, if you will. And these things that are listed out here, I mean, I don't see how much time I got on this. You know, the, they're pretty simple in, in, in their scope. 
I mean, it's, it, you, you look at them in verse 29, they, they talked about it before they wrote the letter. These are the things. So this is what it boils down to. Love God, love people, and <laughs> abstain from things offered to idols, from blood. Don't eat any extra rare, unblooded, <laughs> undrained steaks, right? From things strangled and from sexual immorality. If you keep these things from yourselves, you will do well. Again, this is not, when you look at this, this is not like laying an extra legalistic trip on these guys. These are, these are very practical, spiritual, applicative things that, that would help them be a fruitful witness unto the Lord. If you look at first, hold your finger there. We'll look at this together real quickly. 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Paul really elaborates on this uh, point of the things offered to idols in this chapter. You may want to reread it. I'll hit some high points on it real quick with you. A lot of these things that were set out in this meeting that we're reading about were actually more for the Gentiles to not stumble the Jews. It was actually more for the Gentiles not to stumble the Jews. Verse eight, or verse, Chapter 8 of uh, 1 Corinthians says, Now concerning the things offered to idols... We know that we all have knowledge, and knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. And if anyone thinks that he knows anything, he knows nothing yet as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, this one is known by him. Therefore, concerning the eating of things offered to idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world, and that there is no other God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as there are many gods and many lords. Yet for us there is one God, the Father of whom from all things, and we for him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we are all things and through whom we live. However, there is not anyone of knowledge for some with consciousness of the idol until now eat it as a thing offered to an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled." But food does not commend us toward God, for neither if we eat, or we eat are we the better, nor if we do not eat are we the worse. But beware lest somehow this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to those who are weak. For if anyone sees you who have knowledge eating an idol's temple, will not, eat, will, will not the conscience of him who is weak be emboldened to eat those things offered to idols? And because of your knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died? But when you thus sin against your brethren and wound their weak conscience, you also sin against Christ. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never again eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble. So we see that the appeal here for Paul, particularly around this issue as it is, 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 is appealing to a person that, you know, says, we know that all, idols nothing, you know, you know, if you got, you know, a big fat cow over there got offered to some idol, and you get a discount at the meat market, you go home and make you a big steak. You know, if, if, if your Gentile friend or whoever's coming in there eating, and you know it's going to mess with his head a little bit, it's like, hey, didn't you get that over there? Wasn't that offered to that idol? No, nah, man, I marinated it. It's good now. No. Nah. <laughs> but no, it's, you know, if, if he saw that, you know, it might mess him up. He'd be like, oh, wait, you're supposed to follow Jesus and you're eating something that was offered to an idol, you know? It's messing his conscience up. If we do things of that nature that messes another person up, it says we're sinning against the Lord. You know, it's, it's not one of these things we're trying to make extra rules or anything like that. It's just trying to be considerate. That's the heart of this whole thing. Consider it. You know, consider that guy, man. He, he, he might be new in the Lord. Yeah, you might be able to have a cold one, right, and, and not, you know, get lambasted and, you know, be on a binge, but if you see a brother from the bridge house that just got saved, and he's trying to, he's struggling with that alcohol and that stuff like that, and he's like, man, I can't, you know, I can't do that. But hey, I saw whatever, uh, another brother in the Lord, man, I saw him, I saw him drinking a Corona with his pizza the other day at a little Italy's or something. I don't know. But <laughs> he says, now I'm going to go get me a case. You know, you know I mean, it, it, there's these little things. That, that can help, that can stumble other people. We just got to be aware. And I know as elders and as leaders, we try to be a little bit more of a higher standard, you know, than the rest of the people. So if you have that desire to be a leader, you got to 
we expect you to be a little more sensitive in the Lord, right? Because we don't want to stumble somebody else. It ain't no trip that we're trying to put out. It's just something to be aware of. And there's, you can study that further. I mean, try to make a whole study of that. But So moving right along. Verse 30. So they get the letter. So when, we sent, when they were sent off, they came to Antioch. So they sent those men off. And when they had gathered the multitude together, they delivered the letter. And when they read it, they rejoiced over its encouragement. You know, they're probably so excited, man. I mean, they thought in one minute, <laughs> we're going to have to get circumcised if we're going to go to heaven. Oh, boy. You know? <laughs> and they're sitting there and like, whoa, yeah, this is good. This is good. You know, it's funny. This stuff comes up next week. Y'all got to come back next week. I think Steve's teaching this issue comes up again. It's like, man, what's up? These people running around before you go to church. Like, all right, come here. Come here. Are you circumcised? You know what I mean? It's, it's almost like you get that when you start reading this stuff, man. It's like, what's going on here, man? I mean, it used to be like the outward thing for these legalistic churches. Like, oh, you got an earring in your ear, but at least we never <laughs> drop them. Are you circumcised? It's crazy the way, <laughs> what was going on in these ancient days. But, all right, sorry, verse 31. And so they delivered one, and they had read it. They rejoiced over it in the curve, verse 32. And now Judas and Silas themselves, being prophets also, exhorted and strengthened the brethren with many words. So there again, we see the gifted men sharing their gifts with the body, encouraging these men. Verse 33, and after they had stayed there for a time, they were sent back with greetings from the brethren to the apostles. So there's a little camaraderie going on again among the churches from Jerusalem up there to Antioch. Excuse me, verse 35. Oh, no, verse 34, I'm sorry. And however, it did seem good for Silas to remain there. This is another point in talking about being led and being directed by the Lord. Silas desired, it seemed good for Silas to remain there. There was this sense in him that he wanted to be there with Paul in this situation. And that's another important directive from the Lord, I think, that gives us direction. It's point number six I wrote down. It says, God gives us a desire of our heart. Psalm 37, verse 4, it says, Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. And this is an important thing because some people have got some twisted legalism mixed into their church life. And I've seen it, like, with people in my family that are Christians. They come home from this quote-unquote revival, and they're like, man, I got beat down so bad. I feel like crap. I feel terrible. I am the worst. That guy was good. <laughs> it's like, what? What did you just listen to, man? I don't think mean, it's like, it's like they, they have to get their head decapitated spiritually, and then they feel great because of that? Or they measure their spiritual success of the event or the meeting based on that? There, there's, there's groups out there that do it. It's, 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 like, it's like they have the, they make you feel like, all right, you know, uh, you know, you hear some guy come in and speak about doing mission work, I don't know, in, uh, I don't know, the, the end of the world somewhere in Africa, I don't know. And you're like, oh, no, I never want to go to Africa. I bet I'm getting called to God to go to Africa now because I don't want to go. I must be getting called. <laughs> you're not. You know, if God's not putting it in you, man, I mean, to want to be there, it's probably not leading you there, okay? Now, this is, comes from, obviously, a biblical, you know, place uh, with the Lord, you know, and, and growing in the Lord and knowing the Lord. I believe the Lord will awaken a person's desire to be in a certain place to do something. He'll give them the desire of their heart as they delight in the Lord, and he'll, that'll be a confirming directive for direction, in their walk. An important thing to think about. And when we see that Silas wanted to be here, it wasn't like the, the apostles were making him go. Like, Silas, you got to go, oh, I don't want to go to Antioch. You know, it wasn't nothing like that at all. It was just like, man, I want to be there. I want to see him when, when they say, yeah, we ain't got to get circumcised. You know? <laughs> Yay! Praise session went on for hours. But, you know, so we see this desire to be there. Verse 35, this is the last point probably one of the most popular points of this chapter, interestingly enough. Verse 35, Paul and Barnabas also remained in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. And then after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let us now go back and visit our brethren in every city 
or we have preached the word of the Lord, and see how they are doing. Now Barnabas was determined to take with them John called Mark. And he's first introduced um, in Acts 12, verse 12, if you want to read that. You know, they're having the prayer meeting for Peter. It was Mary was John Mark's mother. And uh, <laughs> this is the way teenagers hung out in the church. Like, hey, come over to our house for a prayer meeting, right? <laughs> a huge house. Apparently they were wealthy because a lot of people were packed in there. But that's where his name's first introduced. But it says there about John Mark when he was called, um, verse 38 says, But Paul insisted they should not take him with him because he is the one that departed from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. So if you look a page or two over, we'll just read the verse, Acts 13, uh, verse 13. And uh, you can go online. Oh, Joel's in here. Yeah, he's back there. You can, Joel taught a little bit on this section of the missionary journey. I think it's on YouTube. It says, Now when Paul and his party set sail for Paphos, they came to Perga and Pamphylia. And John, this is John Mark, departed from them, returned to Jerusalem. So we're seeing in verse 38 a little bit of the reason why he didn't want John Mark on this journey with him. And in verse 39, it tells us, Then the contention became so sharp that they parted from one another. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus. And, but Paul chose Silas and departed, being commended by the brethren to the grace of God. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. You know, some reasons. I mean, I wrote a, wrote a short list. We don't know exactly about this sort of thing. But, you know, whenever you, it's, I find how much text is given to this in the Scripture. That's kind of what I started thinking about as I prayed over this and thought about this more and more. It's like... All we see here, basically, is that there was a contention, verse 39, that became so sharp that they parted from one another. We got a sentence, but it's like every place you read the commentaries that I've found, I mean, it's like there's whole subsections of this, that, and the other about why, 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 what's going on? What's going on in the heat of the battle over there? You know, what's, why the division, why the chaos? And I just think, man, that is such the enemy to steer people in the wrong direction. It's such the enemy to steer people in the wrong direction. I mean, we don't have any extensional writings when you read the rest of Paul's letters that are condemning the situation. Oh, Barney. <laughs> he got that purple dinosaur costume, thought he was encouraging everybody, and now look at him. You know, he took Mark, <laughs> doing his own thing. Divisive. You don't see that. Sorry about the Barney thing. But, you know, you know, but, you know, he's, you don't, you don't, you don't see, you don't see him, like, calling him out. Beware of Barney and Mark. You know, you don't see that in Paul's letters. We don't see that attention drawn. We don't see the attention drawn from Barnabas either. And Barnabas, I mean, he was, a, he was probably a really big dude. I mean, they called him Jupiter, you know, in Acts chapter 13 when Paul and Barnabas were doing the miracles and stuff. The people looked at him and they called him Jupiter. I don't know if I was like, you know, dude, you need to lose some weight, Jupiter, or... You know, you're just a big, tough guy, Jupiter. I don't know. But he's probably a big, robust guy, um, nonetheless. But we don't see the, 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 the negative things squeaking out of this. We do see the one verse. There was a sharp contention. There was a difficulty. And they, for whatever reason, they parted ways. But they were both on what? A mission from the Lord. They were both set on what? Being encouragement to the body of believers. Because that's what they ended up doing. One went one way, one went the other. And obviously we know later that John Mark uh, was to later write the gospel of Mark. And we do have, here you want, you want, you want the dirty? <laughs> Look at Colossians chapter 4. You want the juicy tidbit? <laughs> Your soul hungering for what, what happened that was disastrous from this situation. Well, let's look at it. Is give every praise to Christ. I know it's Pastor Dave taught us. G E. Give every praise to Christ. Ephesians, or not Ephesians, sorry. Colossians. It's so small, I keep skipping over it. Chapter 4, verse 10. And to all it's talking, it says, Asterius, my fellow prisoners, greetings you. And with Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, whom you received instructions, if he comes to you, Welcome him. 
welcome John Mark, this guy that we're a few years earlier we're having a dispute over and with. Welcome that guy. Welcome that guy along with us. You know, God uses things in our lives. Sharp disputes, disagreements, discussions within the fold of the blood of Christ and uh, following Jesus, of course. Not somebody like jumping ship and like following Islam. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's a different thing, you know. But we see that God uses and leads us and gives us direction through interpersonal difficulties. That's the seventh thing I wrote down. God uses interpersonal difficulties that we have in our own walks with sometimes other believers. He uses that to lead us. He, sometimes he uses that to, to lead us at, at a job, maybe, maybe a situation at work, and you got a boss that's really hard on you. You know, seek the Lord in the midst of that. Apply those other things I mentioned before. Talk about the, list them off again. You know, uh, getting direction from God, having a testimony of two or three witnesses is the first one. The second one was appeal to the, to the authority. God, uh, we talked about Paul doing that. Appeal to the authority that's in your life. The third thing was uh, following God's direction for your life is what is the church's stance based on God's word? The fourth thing was Give, God uses gifted men in the body of Christ. Are you listening to gifted people in the body of Christ? The fifth thing is the gifts of prophecy, discernment, and wisdom, and words of knowledge. Are you in an environment where that goes on to hear from the Lord? The sixth thing is that God does give us the desire of our heart to lead us. You know, if your, your heart's in a place, he, you know, it's, God's giving you that. And then the seventh one, obviously, through interpersonal difficulty, God also leads us to Proverbs 27, 6 says, Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. You know, we could speculate all day. Actually, I, was, I thought about speculating for a minute. I got like a list. I don't know if I want to get into it now. <laughs> but I just, it's like, why? Well, why would I want to give more room to what, than what God has already spoken about the issue, right? I mean, God's he's spoken to the issue. And then grace has come out at the end of the issue, of the difficulty, of the disagreement. No need for further destruction. I did see one example that really awakened to me. I don't know if y'all were here uh, when Pastor Kevin taught Thursday. I think it was his last Thursday. But the separation between Abraham and Lot. I kind of I thought that was some interesting parallels. Maybe not not necessarily saying they're the exact same in any way, shape, or form. Obviously, Lot chose a pretty bad path. <laughs> He got a, his wife turned to a pillar of salt afterwards. But, you know, that was, that was a pretty rough path. But, you know, it's, it's, it's according to your faith and uh, continual trust in the Lord. These guys didn't allow this issue to throw them off course. They stayed on course with the Lord, following Jesus, sharing the gospel, trying to build up the body of Christ. No doubt in different areas, you could say that it doubled the ministry in a way. Is another observation from this. And no doubt, like we said, I mean, Mark, for whatever, for whatever reason, at that moment, Paul was looking at, you know, was he able to do the work of the Lord? And then Barnabas was probably looking at it, well, look what the work of the Lord has already done for him through the cross. This grace, we should bring him. Paul, come on. And Paul's just looking at the qualifications. He's going to bail out like he did back then. But hopefully, you know, looking at these things together, these guys, you know, I would encourage you to revisit, rethink, reconsider uh, just where you're at in your walk with the Lord. And, and uh, some of these things I just tossed out here that are from Scripture that, that relate to some of our story tonight. You know, allow the Holy Spirit to, to work them into your life, to apply it as, as he sees fit. Because I know if you're following that direction, you're at least following the direction that's from the Word. And again, if you're building your life on that, man, you're gonna you be on good ground, man. <laughs> You'll be in a solid place. You don't have to worry about the storms when they come. So I'm gonna pray, and uh, we'll dismiss. Lord, just uh, thank you for the gift of your word to us, God. Lord, we we see just uh, man. I'm grateful personally, Lord, that that the, the Gentiles, those that are outside of Judaism, Lord, you died to rescue us 
all people unto yourself. And Lord, you made that abundantly clear, Lord, to those that, that uh, the Jewish people at that time period, Lord, you made it very clear, and we're a part of that promise, and I thank you for it, Lord. Lord, I just ask that you would uh, continue to rightly divide your word to each person in this room, God, including my own heart, Lord, as I meditate on these things, that, that you would uh, help me to walk in uh, what your word says in terms of having direction for my own uh, walk with you, Lord. And uh, I pray the same for these men, that you'd bless them in that, in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. All right, God bless you guys. You can hang out, talk, chit-chat, pray. If you got to run, you can run. Ha, <laughs>